Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm here. I have the honor of uh, hosting Jillian Tamaki, who's a guest of honor at MoCA. Um, she insisted that I didn't just host her and interview her. <clears throat> she said, let's have a collaborative... Well, it would be a little dull, I think, to just... Talk. You said, I, everybody knows everything about me. That's what I think, it, <laughs> and I believe that, too. And it's not true. So I want to start by asking you a bunch of questions. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to, like, you're going to ask me questions, yes. and I'm going to ask Ryan questions, because I know a lot of you are fans of Ryan and have a lot of questions about his new project. So we're going to do that, and then we're going to have um, lots of questions from you at the end, hopefully. Yeah, that sounds good. So I think 2020, something yes. like that. Okay, cool. So I think we can start with the first slide. Um, I had the luxury of seeing you pencil a lot of your newest book, and I think I saw on Twitter that you are 90? Three quarters of the way done. Okay. So can you do, just start, obviously, by telling us a little bit about your first, your new upcoming collaboration? Okay. Well, it's another book I did with, um, I'm doing with my cousin, Mariko, who is a writer. We did Skim together. And uh, this book has been going on forever. Um, by forever, <laughs> I mean maybe three years now from like, writing it together a little bit, short writing it, and us like, kind of workshopping the, the book, and then um, me doing the sketches. And then uh, I went and we researched that. It takes place in Muskoka, which is like the lake country. I thought uh, it was a fictional place, because Michael DeForge mentions it in a comic. It's and not I, fictional. It's a real place in Muskoka, Canada. Muskoka is blowing up. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's so hot right now. <laughs> it's so hot right 2014, now. 2014, <laughs> Muskoka. Here we go. Like I wanna. It sounds like it's such a, a kind of a cool name. It seems frontier made up. town or yes. like a. Okay, but yeah. It's fine. just like a lot of. So you it's went. a lot of lake, but with like really rich people, like with their cabins and stuff on okay. it. Um, but we went up there, and you know, I did the research and stuff like that, and then I've just been. I started it on. It's funny because I started the finals, the final art on like the first day of summer, like June 21st. I'm like, and it's all about summer. It's about the beach and like, yeah, you, like child childhood with your family on a vacation. And I was like, man, I'm like, this is like so cool. Like, I'm, it's summertime and like this is about summer. And then flash forward like six months, it's like the dead of winter, and like their kids are still frolicking in like the water <laughs> and like so bitter, yeah, and like angry. wearing like you know bathing suits and stuff, and I was just like, oh, God, like, this just never is going to end. But the light is at the end of the tunnel. Congratulations. And it's coming out next spring. Uh, in, yes, yeah, spring 2014. So I remember when I saw you sketching some of this, and then having, I, I've read Skim so many times, and I think everybody oh, here nice. is a huge fan of that book. Um, and I noticed, once again, uh, it's a coming-of-age story, talking about yes. youth, talking about Canada. Yes. So I was just curious, like, kind of what you alluded to, if you're working in New York, in your uh, apartment, how do you what go... What gives me the right to... Well, <laughs> I was going to say, how, how do you get back there, like, uh, right. emotionally or well, just those, those this, places and those feelings? Yeah. How do you capture that again? Part of this is, you know, it's um, Mariko, my cousin. It's more her, uh, more, I guess, this is a place she went to when she was a kid, so mm. it's maybe more directly from her. But I, uh, I always <clears throat> really have loved... Comics and books and movies that are very like rooted in a real place. So okay. I don't think I could have made Skin without going to Toronto and like right. going on a you know taking a billion photos. And the same with with this, where I you know you just can't um, imagine you know like the yeah. reality is actually way more strange <laughs> and interesting and like sure. um, textured than you can even hope to imagine. So right. I there's like I love the research component of these. And it's not just a, a trip to go to like a lake and hang out. Like you're taking uh, photos. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we, there was a speedboat that we went on. That was pretty fun. So. That's great. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And then for Skim, did you visit high school? That sounds creepy. Did you go to high schools or not that deep into Did the... I go to high school? I did uh, go to high school. Um, I no, get... but I, there is actually a creepy story about this because that, that school is basically, she went to a very up, you know, she she uh, yeah. uh, uh, girl all girls private school. Oh, okay, okay. And we went together, and she was like, "Oh, this this girl was like a freak, crazy person. Sure, like was sure. not like you know school." And she was like, "She was like, hey, I just wanted to come visit." And like, "Oh, here's my cousin." Like they're like just so shocked that she was there. I'm like, yeah. "We're like, can we just wander around?" And I was like, take like really taking like photos, like 
yeah, I don't think... under my coat kind of thing. So yeah. there was, um, but we were concerned because there are some themes in that sure, uh, yes. book. But so we were concerned that they were um, not going to like it very much. But uh, once it came out and it did well, they couldn't be happier, obviously. <laughs> well, I'm sure some of the girls at that school are stoked. Like I, I have a friend, yeah. friends from LA are like, that's the mall that Back yeah. to the Future was filmed at. Oh, yeah, for sure. So they must sure. be rich. I think they, um, they tout it as, a, you know. That's good. <laughs> Um, the legend of the whatever. Um, I guess we can go to the next slide. I wanted to ask you, since we're talking about the youth, um, <laughs> this isn't related, but I just liked it so much. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you, you know, we're friends, but you're actually one of the people that I know who actually has, like, outright fans. Like, oh, okay. And actually, no, and, like, just, like, <laughs> known people who just adore your work. And also, like, even peers of, like, friends of mine who really were influenced heavily oh, by wow. your work. I'm sure that's sounds sort of funny to you, but they... Yeah, it's weird. I'm not sure but I believe it, you, but... I will tell you that yeah, it is a true thing. Compelling lead-in. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I know you also teach, um, and you work with students a lot. So I'm just curious to... Am I pointing at my students? Did you get extra credit if you yes. come today? <laughs> um, but I was just curious, like, um, so you're interacting with a lot of people who are finding their voice or are young artists. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious to hear how that uh, affects your work. How does it change your perspective on the work you're doing? Um, it is incredibly uh, frustrating <laughs> sometimes because you're very wrapped up in their work and you're very invested. Sometimes it feels like you're more invested in them than they are <laughs> themselves. <laughs> but um, what I think is cool is that they are, you know, into the thing before it's the thing, you know. So I've always found that I my students will start doing something, and then you start seeing it appear other places. So I, I like having a little like preview into like what's going to be cool. Um, and I think that that always helps. But I, I feel like with, um, especially I teach seniors, yeah. it's all about process. And it's all about like not necessarily like w achieving an end, but it's more about setting up a, um, uh, a system for... Uh, that's strong, you know? Sure, um, sure. Uh, and so when you're talking about process and you're seeing people fail and, you know, right. succeed and have a breakthrough and, like, go down the wrong path, I think that, um, and it's a big struggle, I think that that uh, helps me sort of reflect on my own um, thing or my own process Sure, sure, well. sure. Yeah. And there's a bit of, you said you're, like, cool hunting with them, like you're finding out what's going to be... Well, they just, you just, you, you don't, it's interesting because sometimes you don't know this, like, just sort of trends that happen. Sure. And then you start seeing it, like, get diffused, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. I think, at least, I'm, I'm finally old enough that I, I see young artists now, some aren't even from America or, or uh, Canada. Yeah. And they're riffing on peers of ours. Yeah. It's like the cycle is happening so quickly for influences it, to be. It turns over so, right. so, so, so fast. Like, I saw someone who was riffing. It looked like they had already read and sort of sublimated the, like, influences of, like, Brecht Evans' new book. Oh, my and God, And it's, like, yeah. two you months see, later, it's already working its yeah. way through Tumblr. Yeah. It's, well, I think that we're, like, they're the youth. <laughs> uh, we're all sort of looking at these online streams that are, you know, in a way it's great because I feel like younger artists are so much better so much younger mm -hmm. because they've been looking at quality things. But in a way, sometimes it feels like it becomes homogenous a little bit because we're sure. all kind of looking at this super cool stuff. Right. And um, the work looks all super cool, and we're all kind of like ingesting it and like uh, cannibalizing it. Um, but that's why sometimes it's, I feel it's rare to see something just like where it just knocks your head off. You're like, that is so weird. Right. Like um, Karen Katz, who is like, I don't know, maybe she's in the room, but. Uh, is a, a student that, like, I just have never seen work like that, really, yeah. you know? And you're just like, wow, like, where? And that's why I think you have to, like, look outside of illust illustration and right. Tumblr. You have to look beyond that, I think. Yeah, for sure. I find the weirdest stuff I see lately is um, not coming out of America or Japan. Yeah. The stuff that surprises me personally. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, um, it's, uh, it's, like, Eastern European uh -huh. comics or, like, uh -huh. some... Yeah, like uh, Thai cartoonists yeah. and Hong Kong. And not, to, not that we have to look that far yeah. away, but just 
everything else is prepackaged for me in Tumblr or on like yeah. blogs. So. What's interesting is we get a lot of Korean students. I've always had a lot of Korean students in the classes. And it's interesting because they are coming from like a different culture. They have different childhood cartoons and right. books that they read and <laughs> folk stories or whatever that they draw upon. And it's like it's totally unfamiliar to me, obviously. Like um, we all, it's because you grew up in. Michigan, Michigan and yeah. I grew up in We probably ingested the same I watched pop culture. Kids in the Hall and Degrassi Junior High. Exactly, so. and you know what? You know we all we had the same like branded youth, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. or childhood things that were we ate and we loved and we whatever. Um, but when you have somebody from a different culture, it's interesting because you're not familiar with their touch. The inputs, points. yeah, exactly. The original, yeah, exactly. I know what you mean. Um, I was curious. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. I don't know if it's related again, but yeah. Um, just more of your work along the way. But I, I, um, I'm curious to hear, working and teaching, um, you have, your partner is also an artist. So I was just curious to hear, like, with all the collaboration and solo work you're doing, whose opinion do you trust? Like, mm. when you ask, do you ask for feedback? And when you do, like, what exactly are you looking for? Um, I do ask for feedback, but I think that you can ask for too much feedback. Like, I see that in my students a lot because it's like they're, you know, they, they really want stuff to be good. And like, so yeah. they're going to like ask all these people. And like, at some point, opinion is just, it's just subjective. And it's, sure. you know, you, it's just a matter of taste, you know? Like, I think I would ask, um, there are a few people that I know that I would, I would trust you if I have, you know, but, but I, but you can't, I, I think like have a few people and then trust hmm. implicitly what they say. But even if somebody is, great and you admire them, you don't necessarily need to trust their opinion or change what the, I don't know. Some, like I have yeah. a, a, a friend, Chris Buzzelli, who teaches and he says like the best students are always the ones that push back at some point. Oh, you know what I mean? At like, some point not, they finally... They're not just going to sort of like, oh yeah, you, you <clears> said <throat> to do this, then like I'm going to do that or whatever. Like they, they, they see it in their mind, the, the, the potential for an idea. And even if you say against it, then they still have an idea. You need to be a strong enough person to like still go in that direction. Yeah, that makes sense. I I've been wondering a bit like other than in teaching, there really isn't a lot of opportunity for feedback in mm -hmm. comics. Yes. The, the sense of like the sole auteur, like until somebody's like like uh, I'm complaining about it. On yeah, Tumblr. until you get comments on yeah. Yeah, like a writing a mean, writing a mean comment. On but uh, do you think there's a? I, I've been thinking about that too because um. I have friends who are writers, and they do writing retreats, and they do workshopping. Like, mm -hmm. workshopping is a core concept. Yes, yes. Do you think, and now that I'm just starting out as, like, an editor-publisher and trying to figure that world out, do you think there's a role for I it's weird, don't feedback you, or don't you feel that, workshopping? Like, be, don't you feel that in comics, people are afraid of hurting each other's feelings? Because it's such a small sure. community. I guess in writing it's easy to throw out a sentence, but and there's you... but, but there's also more of a culture of critique. Yes, exactly. In like writing or in fine art or something like. Whereas comics, like we're all just making our we're making our stories, and like I we become, we, become, we become friends because like the scene is so small. Sure. So like if I you know we you become friends with people, I think that the, I don't know I feel like there's a, that's a debate that happens a lot online. It's like yeah the criticism debate and like and then yeah how hard it is to have like real critique of stuff um because i don't know yeah it's so small yeah I w i've been wondering about that too and then of course when like a real critique does come out in the new york times or something <laughs> all the cartoonists are like they don't know what they're talking yeah. about like, da, da, da. <laughs> right exactly <laughs> oh, an uninformed person to do this thing. yeah <laughs> yeah the concept of the comics critic. they don't understand the <laughs> well, I, I was thinking a bit about, um, I think we can go to the next slide, but I was thinking a bit about your work and um, the work you're doing with your cousin is collaborative. Mm -hmm. And then I guess your freelance work is collaborative, right? Yeah. By definition. Oh, yeah. yeah. Either, Illustration is collaborative at its core. Yeah. Right. With, with the art director or with yes. the texture. Yes. But then you do have, you do do some comics, mm -hmm. many, um, Half-Life, which was in mm -hmm. No Brow, mm -hmm. that I absolutely love that comic. Oh, thanks. And, um, and your webcomic, which we're going to talk about more in a moment. but. Right. Um, that work is solely a Jillian Tamaki production. Right. In a Joint, sense. yeah. So um, <laughs> do you enjoy it more? And, or do you approach it differently when you know, like, I'm the only person creating and on the hook for this? Or um, I, uh, I like the both. I really like collaborating with people. Sure. Um, and I think that that's, 
maybe why people can't be illustrators a lot of the time is they really they don't really like collaborating. <laughs> it's like it's just illustration is not a style. It's like it's the collaboration is the definition almost of sure. illustration. So, um, but it is it's a little more stressful because I'm not trained in writing. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Or I've never. Sure. It is. Um, a Are little, there trained writers in comics? I guess there's some. I, I guess. I guess. I just. I feel like I, you know, I took a high school English class, and oh, then, sure. you know what I'm saying. Sure, like sure, I, sure. And then I'm not. I don't know. Um, it is. It is a different thing, but I feel that the. That's what the web comic was born out of. Is that I just wanted a small, little, manageable Outlet. thing that was like very low stakes, no money needed to right. <laughs> to invest in it to do anything, and it's like. Um, it's a tossed off thing, not tossed off, but like I don't try to make it look nice or anything like that. So yeah, the individual it, it started, strips don't linger with you after it, you. Yes, it started off as just an exercise, oh. but I think a lot of good things have started off that way. Like some of the oh. embroidery stuff, which we're not going to talk about, but I've always, you know, found that the the best things have started out with self um, uh, imposed projects or sure, exercises sure, sure. or something. Yeah. Um, well, we can go to the next slide. I do want to talk about Super Mutant Magic Academy yeah. because I love it. And I think a lot of people here probably do too. And I want to start by formally saying I think it should be a show, a cartoon. Or I, any um, movie producer. Yeah. No. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, yeah well, I asked other friends like, for questions to ask you. And the first one was, ask her if it'll be an anime. I was like, okay, that's a, good, that's a, real, that's a million dollar idea. But, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious about it. Like, uh, I think you and I had talked about it once before, and you said you might not even be interested in doing a graphic novel about these characters. That it was a strip. First yeah, and foremost. I only see them as a as a strip, like just because I don't think I am interested in their world that much. Well, it's funny because I, I think it's such a rich <laughs> it's such a rich world to me. Like they, it feels cumulatively like it, very lived in and a very fleshed out place. So I was wondering, like, how do you do that as you serialize the story? I how do you world like, build? I guess I think of them as a strip, and partly because I can't think of it as a graphic novel. Sure. Like, I don't really care what, like, the Lord Voldemort of this world is, or, you know what I'm saying, or <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't, yeah. yeah. I, but I, I think that it could have that, and I feel like if it was to go on to another form, I, I want somebody else to take it. Got it. And, like, take it to, and make it their own. I'm not really that person to go take it to um, a different So you don't have like a prequel? It, like, I want to do th is there like a, yeah. I was wondering, like, does it being serialized affect the story? And then I wondered to myself, like, is there a the story to it? Or is it just continuations of their lives? Or I haven't actually been able to devote uh, time to even answering that question. Like, sure, it's so, sure, sure, like, sure. a thing that I do when I'm, like, been like trying to make something nice and shiny and perfect for an illustration or a whatever, and then I just like, Bleh! like I'm really mad at something or something's whatever. I have an idea, and then it's just this is like 45 minutes. Of, so I haven't been able to devote time to thinking of any sort of arc or anything like that. But um, there is a plan for a book, and there will be. Yeah. I think I will be able to sit down and then do like 300 extra things for the book, and then so oh, wow. who, who knows what will happen when you're in that psychological space of sure. like you're just sitting down and like pumping them out. Maybe is, something, maybe something more narrative will happen. Is but. that a news? Is that a, is this breaking news? Is that think, official? I, well, I've mentioned it before, but there is no like official news. Okay. But there, there will be Some, like a collected book. That's great. Yeah. That's really exciting. Yeah. I, I have noticed actually. Um, actually, maybe I shouldn't say, but I I I really like your Twitter. Oh, that's nice. such a weird compliment. But um, but it I it is a weird compliment. It's high praise. No, but um, well, I, I will see you tweet uh like something sort of like critical or grumpy and then like a couple of days later like there'll the, be a, a strip a that about it. is about the same topic yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. I, I definitely think of it as like I an extension been ruminating. of ruminating yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jillian's been thinking about something I know. it is a good little um I guess that's where when I was in school I just felt like I um I didn't really have anything I wanted to say so, you know, maybe that's why I did gravitate towards design. Like, I have, actually have a graphic design degree. And an illustration is that, you know, it's, uh, it was only until after I graduated and I moved to a new city that um, 
I felt like I was having more experiences. I, you know, was like living on my own for the first time, and I actually had something to say. Sure. And so that's when I first started making comics. I, right. That was like the impetus to it. So it's kind of the same thing with that. Yeah, I wondered sometimes. Like, uh, I reread some Calvin and Hobbes last month, uh -huh. and I, I felt a connection to his parents. Yes. And so then I was like, like ah. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is how I know I'm old. Yes. So I wondered with this, like, I see different elements of friends and archetypes in the yeah. character in the students. Yeah. But whenever a teacher comes, I'm always like, is this a Jillian stand-in? Oh yeah, the stu the students are often my students, <laughs> I think, or just being around them. Sure, sure, sure. And um, because I love my students, but um, it's funny because it just it, being around them it reminds you that like. Like you're 21. Like you got other stuff that you're like interested in right now. Like it's New York City and it's like sure, sure. boys and girls and it's everything else. And so you can't. Um, you have to like give them some slack because you were that way too. Like yeah, so. of course. So are we gonna we're gonna start moving to your? Oh okay. Well I have one more. Okay. okay. But um yeah if you wanna keep going. I just like this one. Um and there's one more one uh, more. Yeah. Uh, Oh, one more slide. Oh, one more after this, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I remember we were talking, and you did um, all the rough, rough sketches for your new book in Manga Studio. Yes. Do you want to talk about? I'm just curious to hear. Like, yeah. It almost seemed like a bad word. Like, oh it's my God, really Jesus like Manga kind Studio. of like a silly name. But it seems like a really amazing program. No, it's funny because like it's so like a technical thing, but people are really intrigued by it. I think so, yeah. And like the reason is I hate scanning. I hate, 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 hate scanning yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this book, before I started, I was like, I do not want to like draw every page. There's 300 pages. I'm not going to draw all of them on it with a pencil and like scan them in the computer. So so contemptuous of like the core tool. Oh, um, I, I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, a pencil. Um, uh, you try scanning. No, I, I won't. No. Um, so I was like, I'm going to get. I'm going to try to be smart about this. I'm going to get a Cintiq. Mm -hmm. So I can just draw the things directly in it, and I'm going to um, try this manga studio thing. Because what's cool about it is that you can have multiple. They are not paying me to say this. Yeah, no. Uh, but <laughs> um, but they have. It's multiple pages, so you don't need to have like 300 little Photoshop files. Like you right. just have one file, and right. it'll have like 200 pages or 300 pages or whatever. And you can just. Um, uh, the, it's kind of set up for building the panels and moving, right. you know, resizing them, and like the balloons are in there and everything. It's just, it's all, it was a lot easier. And then of then course, then I printed the things out and inked them traditionally. You did ink so them, it's yeah. Like, you feel like a bit of a tool. But, but then you had something to show the publisher early and. But it was great because you, you could just you could just make a PDF of the thing. Right. You don't have to scan the thing in, fix it in Photoshop, make the levels better, and then put it into like an InDesign and then export it. It was just all there, and you can just PDF. Yeah, I, I think I think um, friends of friends of mine were surprised uh, when people like come out that you were using that or yeah. that Michael DeForge inks completely digitally. Yeah, I think it always surprises people. Horror, oh, it's all digital. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one thing I I've watched you do and I've seen um, online that I've always been really fascinated by and sort of shocked by was um, the embroidery work you've been oh, doing. Oh, thanks. And um, it's like such an extreme. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it sets it up for a perfect question, which right. is like, if you're doing all this work digitally, yeah, um, this is painstakingly manual yes. and very contemplative. I, I imagine. I'm curious how you started doing it, and what do you what do you like about it? It seems very pleasant and lovely. It was something that I, I just thought my work would translate to it, so I just kind of like I think of sketchbooking as beyond a book. You know what I mean? So it mm -hmm. was like I just started making a sampler of it was essentially a fabric sketchbook page. Oh. You know what I'm saying? And so then I just Put it online, and somebody saw it, and you know, then I started making these other things. But it, I'm just really restless. Like I can't not be doing something with my hands all the time. So that's it's a good like thing where you can just like so, do something so the for hours. And you did those penguin covers. Yeah. For uh, and that was just because I put stuff on my blog. Like so many good things have happened to me. That's why I say to the students, it's like you just need to show it. To people, it's like do the work that like, you can't help yeah, but you do. Yeah, can't, you can't choose a lot of the time right. the things that come your way, like you, or or you can't like really control who thinks your work will fit with that. You know, like yeah. it's you just need to be good at the thing, hmm. and like 
show the thing. Like, you would be surprised how many people never get to even just showing the thing because right. they think it's not good enough or it's not exactly right or I'm going to do it later or whatever. Um, I just have had really good success of just putting it out there and seeing what happens. Yeah, and I guess um, but it's primarily like a personal thing for you. That, yeah. That work. Yeah, I mean, this is too labor intensive to really monetize. Like, I'm use that word. <laughs> or do like <laughs> you know, seriously an illustration thing. I, I wouldn't like that. I mean, the thing with the digital and the all digital is that it's so funny to be like tied to materials in that way mm -hmm. because illustrators and cartoonists have always sought the most efficient way to do things. Right. And right now, the most efficient way to do things involves like a digital component for, the, sure, for sure. a lot of people. I mean, you can be a traditionalist, but like those guys that were painting with gouache and oil paint, like in the 60s or whatever, they were hacking the medium too sure. to like stretch it as far and fast as possible. So yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I think that was the end of my slide. Okay, cool. I don't know. Uh, do the next one? Okay, oh. so we're going to switch over. I'm going to ask um, Brian some questions. We should have a hat that we pass to each other. <laughs> yeah, or uh, if we had a microphone, okay. that would be good. Um, so I first became familiar with your work, not your work, you personally through Same Hat blog, which is a, um, which a lot of people are fans of. Um, it chronicles alternative and horror manga. And, and then through your anthologies, I think we met at like the Brooklyn yeah. book like comics. Years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, more than that. Um, um, so I assume that you were always the type of person that were putting together little zines for friends and stuff like that. Can you talk to about what your first scenes were and sure. how you started doing that? Yeah, I, I always liked comics. Um, I liked Amazing Spider-Man and Marvel and those things, but um, I didn't really get into indie comics until after college. Okay. But um, for me, zines primarily, like, I really liked uh, Riot Girl yes. and Kathleen Hanna zines. So the first ones I ever had were the Bikini Kill zines. You're such an enlightened young male. I was a very sweet boyfriend in that yes, I did not. Of course, of course. In that I did not try to get past like <laughs> almost to first base. So it's I was like, like, he just respects me so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, may I please place my hand on? Yeah. I, was like, <laughs> I mean, like have to like get consent like at every. At, you know, yeah. yeah I was yeah. a terrible boyfriend. I mean, great, but really boring. Uh, <laughs> but um, so but um, and then when I went to college um. I stopped reading comics for a little while, but uh, I was in the Bay Area, and it just so happened that my roommate in college, a bunch of his friends were cartoonists, uh -huh. um, including Derek Yu, who's uh -huh. a video game designer now, and um, Helen Joe. That's how I met her. Okay. It's like playing magic in our college yeah. dorm room. Yeah. And those guys were making zines, uh, like minis, I guess. And um, I remember I, I, one time we went to Ape, the Alternative Press Expo, and we were all fans of Johnny Ryan, and uh -huh. we had been reading his stuff. I think Vice Magazine had just come out and wasn't like yeah, yeah. terrible or problematic yet. I, guess. I don't know. But um, Wait, when was this? This is like 2001. Oh yeah, Vice 2000. Magazine was, like when it came out initially, that was yeah. the coolest thing yeah. I've ever seen in my life. I was like, we because you could buy it and you could just get it in certain stores Exactly. And stuff. Oh yeah. Oh my god, it was the coolest thing ever. I'm sorry. No, no, so, um, <laughs> so we were reading a lot of those comics and um, our friends made a comic like that day. Like, over the weekend. Like what? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> and then they went to the copier at, like, the English department and printed up, like, 50 copies. Uh -huh. And I just tagged along. Right. And they were giving the comics out. And they gave one to uh, Johnny and to Dan Klaus. Uh -huh. And the comic was called Erotic Reimaginings. <laughs> and it was, like, drawings of different... It was, like... I guess it was, like, fan fiction. But it was different historical fictions making... Uh, like, characters making out. Uh -huh. um, and then there was one about Dan... Johnny, and I think Adrian Tomine, like, yeah. and um, I heard later that they really liked it, and yeah. that Dan sent a copy to Johnny Ryan. Oh, really? Because, like, he was depicted very well in yeah. it. So, yeah, anyway, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so long story short. Like a class, like a gentleman? Like a... Uh, physically? Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, I see. 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 Um, so anyway, um, but long story short, like, I just was really shocked about the idea of being able to just do it. Yeah. And I think I really thought of it as, like, you need to be in a band yeah. or, like, be on tour or be, like, a, I don't know, like a punk or, like, have something to say. Yeah. And so I think that was the big thing for me was just getting permission to go, like, oh, yeah, you can do totally, it. Totally, totally. 
Totally. So the first thing I ever did, like I, I lived in Japan in high school as an exchange student, and one day they made all the students write English introductions to me. Uh -huh. And they were crazy. Yeah. Like they were really great. They're like, "Do you like Michael Jordan?" Yeah. <laughs> it was like, "Like, do you have a gun? Yeah, like, yeah, are you? Yeah. Would you like to be a ninja?" It was just yeah, like, yeah. Like, I like rabbit. I don't like nothing. I like, <laughs> okay. So, so I took uh, when I was leaving college, I I uh, I took all those and just like Xerox them at work. Right. So I think it's how most. Like stealing photocopies somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I just put it together and just like gave it to all my friends. Yeah. And that was, and it literally was just giving myself permission to just like. And that was this this one here. Uh, right before this, okay. and then the next one I did was issue one of this, and the whole story was like I just want to do a book of uh, first kiss stories. Right. right. And that, that's how it started from right. there, and just right. uh, working with friends. Uh, Sometimes like breaking stuff down to something really simple is like the. Instead of trying to do something really complicated, just doing yeah. something really simple is the way to sort of feel safe enough to do something. Yeah, I, and I didn't have to uh, have a like write a long yeah. uh, personal like essay or even yeah. do like a long interview or anything like that. I just a bunch of stories about first kisses, yeah. and it just sort of went from there. But it really was about permission, like permission yeah. to think that you had something worth yeah. saying. I remember I made like my first scene in like high school, but I never. I was so dumb, like. That I didn't think to photocopy it. I just like made one and like gave it to somebody. <laughs> like, <laughs> like so That's super limited edition so Julian Tamaki. That is that is a deep cut. That is very very deep. But um, I was just yeah. There was nothing. Ha I was I I just hadn't met somebody that was also doing that. That could right. be like oh hey like there's something <clears throat> such a the photocopier or whatever. I mean the, yeah, making friends with someone who has access to a copier. Yes. Is was key. Yes. Yes. So um. From, you know, I'm not the coolest person, but uh, from my vantage point, it seemed to me that um, some of your projects, like Thickness, and you did a Lady Gaga zine, yeah. um, seemed to kick <laughs> off an anthology craze. Oh, I don't know. I won't take credit for that. I mean, there's been anthologies forever, but... Right. I guess in the modern, in the <laughs> current iteration Sure, of it. sure. Um, so... What are some of the best ones that you've seen? Oh. The ones that you like? That's a good question. Um, I like things with like a simple premise. I, I think there's a bit of uh, anthology fatigue, maybe. Yeah. I'm not the only one who feels that way. Yes. Um, every like pop cultural like property or yeah. person now has like a zine yeah. to them. Like if you liked it, make a zine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, that uh, that's. That seems to be the trend now. I'm I'm trying to think on the spot of ones that I've really enjoyed. I think generally speaking, um, a lot of the anthologies that the first ones that I did, the original thing was like as many possible friends as you can get to yeah. give you work, yeah. and like everybody gets one page. Yeah. It's just like, and I love it. It feels like a mix, you know, a mixtape, a mixed CD. I don't know. It it's I think that it feels a little bit like. A way, because we have like so, like the online communities of the way people sort of organize themselves. It become like you become really good friends with yeah, people yeah. that live all over the place, and it seems like now we have the means of production to make the like we are, you're meeting all these cool people, and you have these similar interests, and you have the means of production to maybe secure funding even, yeah, sure, or yeah, like right. or to um, produce these things and mail them all over the place. And I don't know, it just feels like a way of. Um, it feels like an online extension. Of yeah, thing. well, I, I think that's true. Like for me, doing a zine with somebody is mm -hmm. the best way to become friends. Right. I mean, it sounds cliche, but like, Electric Ant, the first two issues I did with my my best friend who yeah. uh, I grew up with, and he he now is doing other stuff. But um, at the time, we were living geographically in the same city, mm -hmm. and so we just would hang out every weekend and just like riff yeah. and write lists. That'd be funny to do this right. and. Um, and then the thickness books, and before that, the Lady Gaga book. That was um, Michael DeForge and I. Who I mentioned before he we did those together, right. and um, you know we were pretty good friends online, and like yeah, yeah. run in the same circles, and like yeah. would email a lot. But it yeah. wasn't until we actually made something. The act of making something yeah. together really like tightens the bonds. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, so. Generally speaking, though, I've, I, the direction I've been taking has been away from one page per artist, right. just like mash, like mixtape things. Yeah. Which I, I still love that kind of approach, but with thickness and then now with the new stuff, it's less people, more pages, yeah. longer stories to yeah. try to really get a 
it's just hard to say something worthwhile in one page. This is, you just have done, done such a good job. You have like an impeccable taste and an impeccable eye. Like I feel like so many people I've yeah, I've been introduced uh, to through your uh, generously making these uh, books that you know mm. then you see them everywhere. So um, can you tell us about your new? You are now okay. Well, you currently work at Google. Yeah. In the day, mm -hmm. uh, you do all these other side projects, and now you've taken sort of the step to being a real some publisher, publisher maybe. Yeah. Is that what you would call? I think it? so. Okay. I, that's what I tentatively. I yes. Mean, yes. Can you tell us about the name of the house is Youth in Decline? Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what this is and oh, your sure. plans for? The idea yeah. generally, it's true. I have a, like a lot of people. I have a day job. It's like fifty hours a week, just mm -hmm. in front of a computer doing actual work. Um, and then everything else that I've been doing is just a side project, and it was getting kind of crazy. Like, right. I'm terrible at making websites, and I have like six yeah. that are all really bad <laughs> right. and like don't right. connect with each other. Right. And then I'd like tweet other stuff. So in theory, this is supposed to make my life easier, not worse. But right. I might have been wrong about that. Yeah. But the idea is generally just to move everything under one name, so right. it all accumulates. Right. But yeah, so Youth in Decline is the first book's coming out at TCAF. Right. And um, I, I think I have a, I'm trying to do three or four books this year, mm -hmm. and then just let it go after that, and, and, and let it grow and see what it becomes. Let it go or let it grow? Let it, are... <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> let it grow, yes. Yeah. Um, do you think that you would ever, I just feel like a little, a, lot, a conversation that I've been having a lot this year um, has been kind of about the economics of comics. Mm -hmm. And I realize it was a little bit shocked to kind of, have hmm. this crystallized to me, but like comics for me will always be a subsidized activity. Oh, sure. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, like I love making them and I do get paid to make them, but I'm not living off that and I'm not doing it exclusively. Do you think that you will ever publish full time or will it always be a subsidized? That's a, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. And actually, I, 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 it's hard to imagine it being the thing I do. Right. Um, I remember when I first started doing my zines, like um, I just used my money from work yeah. to like yeah. subsidize them. So right. it is all coming from me in a sense, but I'm subsidizing right. my like bad habits and like my side. <laughs> You're enabling my, yourself. Yeah. That's, what you're saying. <laughs> That's true. But um, but I remember like looking at the if you I mean, without talking too specific about anything I've heard or whatever, but. I really do like walk around a fest. I remember being like 25 and walking around a fest and saying like, how does this work? Like, yeah, like I want to learn yeah. a business model oh, that actually like can work. Yeah. And the ones that I've seen, generally speaking, is um, the old fashioned book publishing one, which is have one big hit yeah. that just blows the roof off right. and then do fun stuff with the money. Right. Uh, Viz did that in the late 90s with manga, mm -hmm. um, like Pokemon. Mad Pokemon money, <laughs> and then they uh, they could take that money and put out you know um, pulp, yeah. uh, put out Uzumaki and like weird horror manga, right? And then you know when that money isn't flowing or takes a hit, then the cool weird stuff gets you, cut. Yeah, and that's how any book publisher works. Right. Like you you shoot for having one or two big hits, and the rest all come under that. Yeah, the other like ones, Twilight floats all exactly. the yep yep like MFA like yeah. or whatever. The, the new right. novel about yeah, like exactly. growing up and yeah, yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah, exactly. um, but uh, and then That's the other my novel. the other <laughs> the other ones I've heard are um, have rich parents, which yeah. is not a which is something that people don't want to talk about. People certainly don't. Yeah. I like when people if people are in that position, I like when they use it for good. Yeah. So that's there's no nothing to begrudge. Like yeah. there's a lot of books that wouldn't exist if not for right trust funds or yeah. whatever. Um, the other ones, uh, I don't really know any other models. The new one's Kickstarter, I guess. But yeah, um, which I know I read some crazy statistic that it's like the third biggest publisher. publisher. Yeah. Of, yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm trying to figure it out. I will say for me, um, the last few books have made money. Thickness has paid for itself. Yeah. And that's great. Yeah. Paid for itself, meaning like it didn't like pay the rent. Right. Uh, or. But he didn't lose money on it. Yeah. Right. And we were able to pay our contributors and. Um, you know, sharing the meager profits, but it is, it's a expensive hobby, but not just a cost thing. Yeah. I actually messed up my taxes because I was <laughs> writing off all this money because right. I kept losing money every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a little bit here, a little bit there, yeah. and this year I didn't, so right. it was a big shock. Hmm. 
actually, you just put, um, touched upon something. That um, another thing we like to talk about is uh, in private, in in the closed behind closed doors. Yeah. Um, you've been very, but you, online too. You've mm -hmm. been very vocal about paying contributors. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I for myself, my position is always evolving on that topic sure. because the models are just crazy haywire right yeah. now, and you don't know like what is sort of the best uh, plan of attack with that kind of thing. Sure, but sure. you know what? Um, Personally, uh, I I think that even if the thing turns out well, <clears throat> it never feels good in the end. Which part, like the not being not getting paid for it? Yes. And so, um, so you have, um, and it's funny because like you have just been a guy that's been doing these amazing things, but you know you have a day job and everything else. Mm -hmm. But even you will always pay your contributors. For your anthologies, yeah, since and Electric Ant too, together. yeah, right. And so, if you can do it, I feel like it's just if you're a book publisher doing it and asking for free stuff, it's like maybe you need to look at your model again. So, can you tell us why you think it's really important to? Yeah, yeah, sure. I and I do. I, I've been talking about this with a lot of people, um, especially now. It seems to be a hot topic. I think because there's been a bunch of successful Kickstarters right. and there's a lot of anthologies. Right. Now, I can't speak to actual. Publishers, right. like the success, successful ones that we all know, like the bigger right. ones. Right. But I, I guess I'm talking more personally, just about my size and my scene. Right. Um, doing anthologies with friends, I, and my my feelings have changed over time. But I gen yeah, totally. I generally feel that like if you um, are working with contributors and uh, you have to pay them in something that's not right. exposure bucks, because that's <laughs> exposure bucks TM. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not. Yeah. I was like, it is not legal currency. Yeah, like, yeah, like, you, you can't cannot, spend that cannot money. Cannot exchange uh, yeah. exposure bucks. For uh, it's like bitcoins or some like fake thing. I don't yeah, know about. Like, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, so even if when I say like people should be paid for their work, like it, it can be like a stack of free books that you right. get to sell. Right. Um, it's not like you're giving them that you can you can even give them a ton of money, but I think it is a token. Yeah. It's a gesture. Yeah, that we're not just sort of like all fun friends. That, right. Yeah, I don't know. No, no, it's true, and I, I've been surprised by how many books like don't books that are well regarded or in bookstores. Yeah. And like the main premise is that the contributors don't get paid. Yeah. And I, I don't understand. I don't understand what I understand what the work that a publisher does to market and like right. promote the books, right. but. At some point, you're just a guy paying the printer. Right. If, and, and if you're, and so I, I just have trouble with the, uh, if a Kickstarter can raise X thousand dollars, right, and print you know 500 books or a thousand books, but right. can't afford to pay 10 bucks a page. Right. I mean, like, right. I'm not talking everyone should be paid. It, the amount that I pay people is not what they deserve. They deserve right. much more. Right. It's right. just that if you really get into right. the money of it, at this point, there isn't a demand to sustain fair pay almost. Right. Right. To an extent. Right. So um, I've generally found if you work with less contributors per book, it's easier to give each of right. them more. Right. But yeah, if you if you can afford like ten thousand dollars to print this book run, but you can't give everyone ten bucks a right. page, right. then like you can't actually afford to print the book. Right. Like that's right. part. It's an input. Like yeah. the thing I said to somebody was you can't you can't make a you can't like sell a shirt that you made <laughs> yeah. if you can't afford to like pay for cotton. Yeah, exactly. Like that shirt yeah. does not get made. It's it's sort right? of interesting because the Kickstarter thing it makes things actually possible like physically possible to make a thing, mm -hmm. but maybe that thing is not made in a sustainable right. fashion. It's about I guess maybe sustainable ability. I don't yeah, know. I think I think that's fair. Um there's just so many good people is the thing that are willing yeah. that are so passionate. It's just artists like they're so sure. passionate about certain like about things and they want to make things and they want to collaborate and be part of a cool thing and like make new friends and yeah. stuff. It's like it's sometimes it's just so seductive. And, but I it, think it goes both ways. Like I mean, um, we have talented friends who do stuff for free all the time. And like if someone I like is like, hey, can you write like a two-page like interview for my zine. Yeah. I'll I'll do that for free. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. it's more of a philosophical thing. But there's right. always going to be, and there always should be that like. I think Mickey Zakili, who's a friend of mine, said something really smart when there was um, a fan, a popular comics. I was gonna say journal, but then I gave away who I'm talking about. Anyway, a comics <laughs> site was talking about Kickstarter and a specific right. project, and there's a lot of back and forth, and I think um, there's interesting points on both sides. Uh, um, 
And Mickey said, the premise of this whole argument, uh, not in these words, basically the whole premise of this argument is messed up because it's making the assumption that you need $2,000 to make a zine. Right. right to, to like right. do high color printing and right. you really don't. And I think right. that's a good, for people who are starting right. off and making books, like you really just need access to a copier. Right. Um, right. And if you write it yourself, you don't, you don't have to pay anybody. Right, right, right. So there's always that. Interesting. So, oh, and then the next one. Oh, this, sorry, can you go back? back actually? This is your studio? Yeah, I have in, a little office space. Yes, uh, in, in San Francisco, yeah. where you live. Um, and it just is a risograph and like a bare, like a couch. Yeah, I don't, even have, I don't even have drying racks yet. But um, yeah, uh, me and a couple of friends, um, Hannah, uh, Hannah K. Lee's here, who's a friend of mine. We, we are there most weekends just printing. Mm, and so we do some projects for friends and mostly um, but um, the risograph craze is crazy because you can do high quality stuff for super cheap. And it looks so cool. Yeah, for it sure, does. For sure. Can I do the next, next one? So, oh, wow. <laughs> um, uh, this is the dome. Yeah. And the dome is a very special place to us because you organized, this is a weird way to end. <laughs> you organized a uh, <clears throat> kind of a retreat. Mm -hmm. um, can I go to the next one? And it was. <laughs> You even had. Should have worn our shirts today. I know. I didn't know. You even had t-shirts, t-shirts made up. Yeah. Uh, this is on the, the top of. This is in Joshua Tree. And it was so key. Actually, go back for a second. We were like, oh, like they're gonna think we're so weird. Like we're gonna think that we're a cult. A cult. And like, yeah. Like you're the cult leader, and we're like a cult. And then we we looked at like these pictures. Like we look like a youth group. Yeah. <laughs> we look like a, like an Asian church. <laughs> Like not tough. And then we're and then weird. Lisa and I are like these weird missionary yeah. like, like. Oh my god! Yeah. Like, yeah, we thought we were a lot cooler. Yeah, like like a lot creepier. <laughs> we were creepy. Not dangerous. No. <laughs> the next one. But uh, yeah, we did have a lot of fun. Here's Lisa Hanawalt. Um, <laughs> this is after we just got there and we were yeah. like running around like they have a pool they have a like uh mountain lions they have mountain lions. <laughs> they're <laughs> birds went on a hike next one Made here's food. helen joe making uh curt kimchi fried rice yeah yeah I, it was fun i think well the the thing if i mean i'm sure a lot of people feel this way too but you really there's certain friends you only see at cons yes and usually when you yep. see them you're dehydrated yeah you're hungover like you're we are now. probably hungover like we are Right now. now a little yeah. bit yeah. after right karaoke now. for four yeah. hours um <laughs> but it's just it's a bit of a bummer in that like the connections you make to these people are important and personal yeah. and they're through comics yeah and most of the time honestly like you you just want to like talk about comics and talk about that stuff but if you only meet while really tired yeah. at a group table afterwards yeah. it's a bit of a bummer yeah. so the premise for this was just like Let's all work somewhere together. Yeah. So the thing I was talking about, about workshopping. Yeah. Kick, not even kick ideas around, but there was a bit of that. There was like yeah. Anthony Wu was showing us how he does digital coloring, right. or Derek was showing us a new game he was doing. Yeah, yeah. But the main thing was just like, let's actually hang out not at a con. Yeah, yeah. And like make this real. Yeah. Um, it's just interesting. Again, I feel like these are people that you actually are interacting with daily mm -hmm. because they're your online with them and like yeah, they're your sure. friends and like your our brains are in like an online sphere yeah so much it is the environment now almost um but it and that's easy it's easy to sort of like follow people's work and where yeah. you know it's, it's so easy to do but it's actually kind of hard to take it offline and into real life and that's yeah. like what i feel like you're so good at doing is like you have this balanced energy and like you actually when you say you're going to do something you do it and you say i'm going to like get a big dome and roll. I was together. drunk when I wrote that first email okay. or something. <laughs> I was like, let's all go to the desert. Yeah. But then you actually, you researched it, you set it up. Like made it shirts. Was, yeah, it was like, it's, you made shirts, you, you tricked Michael DeForge into designing shirts for us. Or he, and he didn't come. Yeah, I know, I know. I did mail him a shirt. Yes. And then I emailed him every day while we were there. Like he was CC'd on all the emails. It's really so mean, like, isn't it? it was Ryan karaoke at a weird oh, bar. We go the next. next one. <laughs> oh. This is the last one. Oh. Here's us working. You're making a scene yeah. or something. And Lisa was working on a... Well, it was great for me because um, I just got to see all you guys working. Right. So I saw you penciling. That yeah. was... And I, I took... I realized I took a lot of sneak photos. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 
I, like oh. when you guys were all asleep, I, it sounds really weird. Oh. <laughs> no, but I did. I remember getting. No, I really did. Though I remember getting up one morning and being like, "Wow!" And like Helen was working on her contribution for a Sailor Moon zine, uh -huh. and uh, Lisa was coloring something for her book, which is debuting like now. Yeah. Um, and you were penciling, so yeah. I was just, it's 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 fun yeah. to actually like yeah. see those things in real life. Yeah, it was great, and I feel like I've seen I've heard of other people doing similar getaway things, yeah. and I feel like there is that desire to, you know, uh, extend those online relationships to yeah. real things. It just takes a lot of effort because everybody lives all over the place. Yeah, and I feel like I feel like the there's some shows, a lot of the comic shows now. Are sort of evolving a little bit into like the festival, the European festival model, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it has a the initial premise is like workshops, yeah. maybe not selling yeah. at a table, yeah. but actually like symposiums, talks, workshops, and I think that's touching on the same thing. Right. That like people want more than just the selling behind a table yeah. transaction right. thing. So. Yeah, for sure, for yeah. sure. I think we have like ten minutes for questions if you want, Jenna. Yeah. So, so. House lights. Yeah. Well, there's more people here than I thought. <laughs> Thank God. <you> <laughs> Hi. Thank Hi. You so much. It is so much fun to hear you guys chat. Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, um, and it's nice to see, um, you know, that you you have like this that there's a community um, of people who are making, you know, making work and making comics. Um, my question is, um, do you do you have advice for uh, for people who are just starting out um, in how to create that community? Like, how do you how do you find, how do you make friends with, with cartoons? How does one make friends <laughs> and influence people? Yeah, for power and no, no. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just have, um, I'll just tell you my own experience. Um, I uh, started making comics um, in 2004 or five, and I, I just put the stuff, I sold it online, um, and then I just showed up at the, Places, you know what I mean, like and metaphorically and literally. Yes, I checked in, but I, I like my first show was SPX, and cool. I didn't really. I had like two little things, and I just like showed up there, and like people. That's like the cool thing about comics is everybody's just interested in new people and new things to look at, and if it's cool, like they're gonna think it's cool, and you're gonna meet people, and they're because it's all the same people. <laughs> yeah. Every time, um, and you'll you'll see people. They just start showing up one day, you know, at, yeah. like, and then it's like they're there the next time, and they're there the next time. And honestly, I think that um, it's with any sort of it's with illustration too. I think you have to, if you're a shy person, you just need to kind of push it down a little bit and like dive in and like see that the world is not going to crumble, you know, yeah. <laughs> if, if you you know somebody if you if you put your stuff out there. So I, yeah, a lot of it's just the repetition of going to shows. Yes. I mean, that's a luxury that. You know, some people don't have if you live right. somewhere where you can't get to these things. Right. But if you really just come to the shows right. over time, like the bonds start to build. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And this one sounds really silly, but um, the it sounds sort of weirdly. Uh, it sounds weird, but if you like someone's stuff, I think just buying their mini is the best thing. Like, yeah. It's not. It's not buying friendship, but I really. <laughs> but no, but I really like the the yeah. way that most of my people I work with, at least. Right. For uh, they're, they're all my friends, right. but um. It really just started with buying their mini. Yeah. Just like, or do a trade. Or like or literally just like, like two bucks, I feel put, like put your money where your mouth is. Maybe I and... emailed you or something. Or I was just like, hey, your thing is cool. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean? Like literally that... just, I've made a lot of friends that way where like somebody just reaches out and you're like, and then that's it, right? So, yeah, I, think I don't that's know. I think, I think people are just very naturally interested in whatever's new. So that's your advantage as somebody who's, uh, younger or newer or just out of school or whatever. Yeah. People love fresh meat. <laughs> I say that with, the, I mean, just to go back to the illustration thing a little bit, it's like, I think students get a very, uh, or beginning illustrators get very frustrated in that they feel they don't have anything to build on. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't have any new job, like any, any clients. They don't have anything sort of going. They're just starting out. And it's like, well, you do have something that like somebody who's more established doesn't have. And that is that you're, Fresh and sexy and young and cool. Yeah. And like that is what people want. The potential that you have something new to say. Or whatever. Yeah, or just that you're saying it in a, in a cool way. And like that is, I mean, this is a very, it's more talking about illustration now, but like that is um, a very fashion, mm -hmm. youth driven kind of world. And like if you have something that is young and cool and sexy, then you have, you have that's currency, right? Yeah, so, yeah for sure. Yeah. 
Heidi. Oh, sorry, did I take? Um, I just want to ask you more about uh, the risograph because uh, oh, okay. that seems to be the buzzword. I just everywhere yeah. I go, I hear risograph. So, so could you just explain a little bit more about the wonderful machine? Sure. <laughs> well, every time I talk about it, I, it gets harder to buy stuff on eBay for cheap. So it's <laughs> it's kind of a double-edged sword, I guess. Can but you maybe just break it down even further, like what, what it, it kind of roughly yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's a it's a Japanese-made machine, and it's basically like a high-volume screen printer. Um, it, I think the technology is mostly like a mimeograph, um, and really what it is is it's a scanner or a connection to a, a computer, and it um, whatever you input or scan, it burns it onto a screen. So it uses heat to burn a, a really thin screen, and it's all automatic, so it takes like 30 seconds. And the screen is like a layer on a screen print. And it can print about 100, I mean the reason people like it is, um, it doesn't use heat to print, like toner, like a Xerox, so it doesn't break down that much. And it just prints really fast. You can print 150 pages a minute. And In a way, it kind of looks like a photocopier. Yeah, it's like, ging, ging, yeah. it just goes. But um, it, uh, the cool thing about it is you can, it does color. And the way you do color is very similar to screen printing. You print one color out, um, swap the drum out. It looks like the ecto containment unit from Ghostbusters. <laughs> you press the green button and you pull it out. It's real heavy. Um, and then you literally just put another color in, and then you just run the paper through again. So it's like screen printing in that you can do, you know, trapping and multicolor prints, but um, it's really fast. It's super blue collar. It's like a work work machine. The one I have, uh, I got from a church uh, for like 400 bucks, and I think they were just getting rid of it. It also weighs like a ton. Right. Like. Um, busted knuckles, and it's just crazy heavy. But basically, um, they're used primarily by churches and schools in Japan, and uh, churches here in America, too. So it's just very economical. If you know somebody who has one, it just has, uh, it ups the production level quite heavily. There's, um, I started a mailing list for people who have them. You can email me later if you want to join. But we just like, like, oh, this thing broke. How do I fix it? Um, but yeah, they're very in vogue right now. And, I, and it's less because it's, Trendy, and mm -hmm. I think more just like it literally gives you a great value. Yeah. For the money you'd spend at Kinko's to do a right. simple black and white thing, right. you can do these beautiful duotone or multicolored books. So many of my students are very into like printing, like like silk screening and etching and stuff like that, and I feel like that is a high volume way of doing that too. Yeah, I, I I've never one of those people who liked like screen printed covers right. on comics. Right. Because you have to pay like seven bucks more for the book, and right. it just doesn't add that much value right. for me. But the the resales are like they're from the '90s, though. They're kind of yeah. There's new ones like now. You can buy them used. Almost everyone who has one has one who's used. But right. they're allowing things like um, Oily Comics uses one just for black and white. But because of the volume and the cost per like copy, it just makes it much more economically right. viable to do lush or just basic stuff. So, right. um, but I first heard about it because uh, people in Providence. Uh, RISD kids like Mickey Zakili and a few other folks, but um, there's one. There's a couple people in New York have it. Yeah. Toronto, Providence, Austin. So probably a friend of a friend has one if you're a kid who wants to like print yours on it. Yeah, I know like Pratt has one. And, oh. yeah, yeah. But it's just a means. Uh, it's just cheap and it's pretty, so it yeah. works for me. Yeah. Hey. Hi. Um, yeah. Oh, hey, what's up? What's up, man? <laughs> hey, so, um, Jillian, I heard you say that, you know, it's important, like, you're just about there, just, like, get it out there. And for both of you guys, I was wondering, what do you think are are the best uh, kind of venues for getting stuff out online? Is, like, is Tumblr still okay? Is, you know, <laughs> was it ever okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my, my webcomic is on Tumblr, and I think that, I see a lot of really cool comic stuff on Tumblr, so I, I like it. And it's as long as you don't take it too seriously. Yeah, that's like the danger of it, where like you think that the feedback you get on there is is really as long as you don't think it's too valuable. Like it's just you know what I mean. It's I don't know. No, I mean like there's a feeling like uh, this got 180. Yeah, like notes. this is better than that one that I did that got five notes or whatever. And like that's not necessarily true. Because there, are, somebody you described Tumblr to me as like a, sh a teenager shoebox in the sky, <laughs> which was totally That's very poetic. yeah, which was really interesting to me. I um, I just have 
I, sometimes I wonder, like, I had a sketch blog. I feel like um, yeah. that people look at that less now. But it is nice to have something kind of permanent, like a permanent record. But, yeah. yeah sorry. Oh, no, I, um, I think Tumblr is good for getting a barometer of what people like in a really broad way. Right. Like, if you post, I can sort of, like, same hat, uh, the blog about manga has a Tumblr, and I can tell what people are into. Yeah. And I don't follow, like, post more things that they like. Right. But it's really clear to me, like, oh, I'm the only one who cares about that. Yes, yes, But I think yes. the main thing for getting stuff out there, I, there, the initial premise of, like, how do you get people to look at your stuff, I don't actually know. But I will say that, um, like, no platform fixes that. Like, Facebook yeah, doesn't fix that. Twitter doesn't fix that. I agree. That. But I think doing stuff and I think over... People, and I think also think people notice, like, people will find it if it's great. Yes. Yeah, sorry. No, that's true. And, but I think the main thing is just, like, consistency. Like, um, someone told me once, like, the most important thing for your zine is to put out a second issue. Yes, that's it's true. Like, that's like the, like, that's until true. you've done a second issue, you don't really have a thing. That's true. That's true. So, in that sense, too, like, having a consistent, like, recurrence of serialized con content or whatever it might be. Right. Like, I think just doing, accumulating stuff and over time is really, it's, yeah, it's so basic, I, but I think just doing it for a it, while. That is so much easier said than yeah. done, for sure. And a lot of people can't even manage that, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote that blog for about um, two, a year before anyone other than my friends wrote it. Right. And, and it, it just, you just keep plugging away at it, yeah, and then eventually, sure. if it's, Easier said than done, though. Yeah. Other question? Oh, I think oh. we're all out of time. OK. I guess we're done. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was very abrupt. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you.